Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good, morning. Good to have you here with us. Uh, as, as I've been promising for a while now, we're, we're finally going to look at what the scripture has to say about creationism and evolution. Um, uh, so let's, let's uh, open with a word of prayer. And uh, as, as we've been talking before we went uh, live here, um, Jeff was telling us about a, a podcast called Goodfellows with Dr. Myers. And there's one episode in particular that's about uh, creation and evolutionism. Um, sounds like it's a good listen. So if you've got the time to check that out. Uh, that's the only thing I can tell you is uh, Goodfellows with Dr. Myers. Uh, and then look for the episode that has to do with creation and evolution. Maybe there's more than one about creation and evolution? I'm sure that there is, but this one in particular has okay. three individuals. That are... Okay. Yeah, uh, and they're not all Christian. Yeah. So let's pray. Almighty God, maker of all heaven and earth, uh, we are grateful to you that you have chosen us to be the, uh, the crown jewel of your creation, that you have endowed us with amazing gifts, talents, and abilities, and most of all, that you've made us in your image. We pray, Lord, that your spirit would descend on us now and, and dwell among us as we study your word so that by your word we might know the truth and that by that truth we might be able to continue to stand firmly on uh, what your word says and not be turned aside by any of the false prophets of this world. Lord, bless us now and, and guide us by your spirit's power. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, on the page that says biblical issues, Original sin should be the first thing that comes up. Sin entered the world and brought death with it. Therefore, death could not have existed before sin. Okay, so according to the Bible, sin happened first, then came death. But evolution demands that many deaths must have taken place before man could exist. All right, so now that you brought your Bibles, or, or you can look on the neighbor next to you, look up Romans chapter 5, verse 12. And uh, whoever reads this, read it methodically, because there is a certain progression here that is really important for our understanding of creationism and death and sin. <laughs> Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Okay. Sin came first. Death came next. And of course it came to all mankind because all mankind are sinful, uh, but that's the important key to take away from that. Sin came into the world through one man, and because of that man came not only sin, but also death. Uh, so that's the, that's the first and most important thing to, to mention is that um, sin came first, and sin can't come unless human beings are here to commit those sins. And that's the part about well, the, the, just the, the, the difference between sin and death and, uh, what's the other thing I'm leaving out of that? Mankind himself. Uh, that, that's just the progression. First was man, then came sin, then came death. That's the progression. So man had to come before death. That doesn't fit with what evolution says. Evolution says man is the product of many millions of deaths over many millions of years. And that's just not true. So with that being said, let's look at what God's intention, purpose, and care is for all life, especially man. So we're going to go back to the beginning of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1. <clears throat> and, and this is it's just uh, a little over one chapter. We've got the time, so uh, if somebody wants to start reading that, whenever you stop, 
Someone else can take over for you. Who's next? And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. Let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called this the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in to one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation and plants, yielding seed and fruit, trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, Plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its own kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. Thank you. All right, who's next? <coughs> Verse 20. And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let, let birds multiply in the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so, and God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, Okay, thank you. Verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our, our image after our likenesses, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps in the earth. 
For God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the, of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with the seed of its fruit. You have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Okay, three more verses. Starting chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the earth of the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. All right, thank you. All right, so, yes, Hazel. That part that I read. Yep. Um, so it says, uh, and let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And and God called the expanse heaven, and that's with a capital H. I don't know why they capitalized it. I mean, I it's what they called it, or that's what God called it, heaven. But it's not the same heaven as. Like where we go when we die. That's not That's the same just, place. I see a rest of the place when they refer to the heavens. It's right. talking about the sky. Yeah. And that's all this is talking about is the sky. It's not talking about the place where we go when we die and are yeah, raised up to new life. Capitalization made me wonder. Yeah. And I don't know why they capitalized it. Uh, I think that there is capital letters in Hebrew and maybe the original had, or Aramaic, <coughs> maybe it was capitalized in that. So they're just being consistent. <clears throat> I can't tell you why they capitalized it. Well, I just was questioning whether it's supposed to refer to God's kingdom or just. I, no, I don't think so. <clears throat> yes. Okay. So in verse 27, it said he created male and female. He created them. Yep. Right? Yep. So then later on, it tells us that God created man. And the man was lonely, and then he created the woman. So is that like, is that contradictory there? It no. says that he created man and woman, but then later on it says he created man, and then he created woman. Yeah. So it just seems like yeah. which came first? When did he? When did he? Well, this is for everybody. When did he create Eve? After Adam. After Adam. After Adam. Yeah. yeah. But what day of creation did he create Eve? Sixth day. Sixth day. Yeah. Now, that can be a bit confusing because chapter 2 talks about how God went about doing that. Yeah. And, and um, near as I can tell, chapter 2 is really just more of an explanation of how he did what he did in chapter 1. It's not uh, a progression like everything happened in chapter 1 and then the stuff in chapter 2 happened after that. That's not how it is understood or should be understood. Right. It just seemed like, that's how I understand it, but it just seemed like, okay, why did... They talk about it this, and then maybe, like you said, greater details in chapter two. Yeah. And 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 uh, I don't know how God fit all this in in 24 hours, other than the fact that He can say it and it just is, so He can create things pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, but th that's neat, though, that that's there. Verse 27 is because it says He created male and female on the sixth day. So. Uh, even though when we read chapter 2, it might seem like Adam was wandering around for a while, lonely, and then God made a wife for him, and that could take how, how long, we don't know, but it didn't. It all happened in the same day, from sun up to sundown. Um, I don't know how, I, I, uh, but I don't have to know how. I trust that God's word is true. Um, and so when I look at that verse, like you said, um, I'm comforted to know that God did what he said he did on the day that he said he did it. 
but I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Anybody else have questions about any of that that we read? If not a question, a comment. I don't know if this is true or not. I've heard other people say it, so I'm just going to parrot what they say. But according to them, there was a logical progression to God's creation. Everything that was made when it was made depended on stuff that was made before it. So before there could be plants, what did God have to create? Well, the earth, yes, I hadn't thought of that, but you're right. The earth, a place for the plants to grow. Seed. Well, seed, yes, but light. Light. Plants need light. The chlorophyll, or however that works, that changes carbon dioxide into oxygen. I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm not a biologist or a botanist, so I don't know what the right terms are. Um, but plants need light in order to grow. And so the first thing that God made was light. Um, and then there was the heavens and the earth. And then there was, uh, on the third day, plants. After light had been, and earth had been created and established. Where did the light come from? Because God didn't make the sun and the moon and the other stars until the fourth day. So what was the source of light? Himself. Yeah. That's the only thing that makes sense is God was the source of light. And he was also, when he withdrew, a source of darkness. Not Darkness isn't a thing. It's just the absence of light. So when God stopped shining, I guess, so did his light, and there was nighttime. I don't know how that all works. He said that there'd be water, there was water, or whatever, earth. So could he just say, let there be light, there would be light without any source? Did it have to have a source? Yeah, well, I mean, there, there, what, what did, there could be, but again, to get to your question, that, that doesn't make sense to us. I mean, because every light source we know of as human beings, it has a source somewhere. There's a source to it. Yeah, but this is creation. And this is God. <clears throat> he can do things different than what we do. Yes, he can. And he does things differently than we can imagine. So I'm not saying you're wrong or that you're right. I'm just saying we don't know what the source was, but it seems like God would be the source. Is that what you're saying too? No, I'm saying that... Oh, it didn't have to have God as source. He created light. Yeah. Once he created it, I don't think he had to be there like you and me would have to be there when we're doing something. Yeah. You might be right. So you're saying that... Because he's all over anyway, so... Yes, Jeff. Well, you said he created light on the first day. Yeah. So when did you say that he created the sun? Fourth day. <coughs> the greater light to rule the day and the lesser Does it say light specifically that he created the sun? Well, I mean, it yes, says it the two great lights, the greater and the lesser. We, we always assume that that means the sun and the moon. But yeah, it's in I, verse um, 16, God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. But to Jeff's point, it doesn't specifically say sun and moon. It just says greater and lesser lights. So we assume, Jeff, rightly or wrongly, that that meant the sun and the moon. But you've been listening to Goodfellas, so you may have more insight I have to, to this than, than I do, perhaps. I don't talk about this. <clears throat> the first thing you said, let there be light, and there was light, but it didn't necessarily come from the sun and the moon. But we have light before the sun comes up. I well, mean, it, the sky lightens. Yeah, but that's still because of the sun. It's <coughs> still the source of that light. Not that I want to argue with you, Dorothy, but <laughs> it is still from the, either the sun or the moon or the stars. It's one of those sources. We've got light. Good conversation, folks. And uh, sometimes a, a good pastor has to be able to say, I don't know. And, and I've said that a couple of times, I think. Or at least I, in my head I've said it. Any other thoughts or questions about 
Genesis 1. When God said, let us make man in our image, one of the things that sticks out to me about that is our image. Why would... Now, Jews only believe there's one God. The Son is not God. The Spirit is not God. Just God. Yahweh. Um, so why would he say our image? They have a reason. It's not real convincing, but they have a reason for it. Um, why do we as Christians believe he said our image? Right. That's what... That's what what uh, Jewish people would say. It's the royal we, that God is so sovereign and holy and whatever that he talks about himself in third person plural, I guess. But, or first person plural, sorry. But that, that's just not convincing. What did you say? Angels? Could be. Could be him and the angels, but of course the angels weren't creators. Trinity. As Christians, we believe it's, he's referring to his Trinitarian nature. Was Jesus, let me rephrase that, was the Son of God there when God created the heavens and the earth? Yes. 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 How do we know that? That's so in John. John chapter? One. One, yeah. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. When John talks about the Word, he's not talking about God the Father. He's talking about God the Son. Oh, and so in John chapter 1, John is saying, Jesus, now we know him as Jesus, um, was there at the very beginning with God. And he was God. Uh, was the Holy Spirit there? Yes. Yeah. What is something in the text that could tell you that the Holy Spirit was there? And the Spirit of God is yeah, yeah. Now, again, if you're Jewish, you can believe that just means the the um, personality of God or, or whatever. Um, but we know that it's capitalized here for a reason, because it's the Holy Spirit. Um, so God's Spirit was present along with God the Father, and according to John chapter one. The Son, the Word, was present. So all three members of the Trinity were present at creation. Any other comments before we move on? <clears throat> if not, let's flip to the New Testament and look at Acts chapter 17. Somebody read uh, chapter 17, verses 22 to 29. So Paul, standing in the midst of the... Areopagus. ...said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship... I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined the allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. For we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Okay. So the, uh, the initial bullet point was what's God's intention, purpose, and care for all life, especially man? How is that question answered, so to speak, uh, by that text that was just read? What is God's desire for every human being? They should seek him and find him. 
find him. Yeah. But he is actually yeah, not far from us at all. He's right there. He's present everywhere. So anyone who, uh, by the Spirit's power, reaches out for God, finds God. Because he's, he's everywhere. You don't have to go to Corinth or Athens or Rome or any place to, to find God. He's right wherever you are. Uh, that's what he has promised to be, is to be present wherever we are. Um, notice what it says about the, uh, the other gods. Look at verse 29, for example. What do other people use to, to make their gods? Gold, silver. Gold, silver. Gold. And it all comes from where? Their own imagination. They all imagine what a certain god would look like, and then they make that out of whatever material they want to make. That's pretty much going back to the beginning, not, not as far back as Adam and Eve, not quite, but close. Um, mankind has always made gods for themselves because the God of the Bible is invisible. At least he was up until the, the birth of Christ. Before that, he was just an invisible God. And so people felt like they needed to make him uh, but of course they weren't making him, they were making other gods, and then they decided, well, we'll just worship these other gods. But the God, Yahweh, um, his desire is we seek him and find him. Uh, in him we live and move and have our being. Where did they ever get the idea that something made of stone and silver or gold had to be made of God? Where did that come from? Well, there's a lot of ways I could answer that, Hazel. Um, is it just that they're desperate for a control of figures? Yeah. What did, what did Adam and Eve, why did they fall? What was their main sin? Temptation. Temptation? No. Temptation is... Temptation. God. They wanted to what? To be, God. to be God. Yeah. So they wanted to, to make themselves into gods. Well, I mean, you're kind of answering your own question. Why do people make gods? Because then they can control them. That this god that I've just made will do whatever I tell it to do. What's that? going to tell the god what to do? Well, they're not going to expressly say that, but... What's that? How are you going to worship something that you're telling what to do? Thank you. That's the question that the prophets of the Bible, from God, had for those people. How are you going to make something and then you're going to ask that something to help you when you made it? Ezekiel was... You mean when it was laid in the ground separate, it didn't have any power, so where did it have power if it control those weak-minded? That's... That, they could have been weak-minded. Um, there's a lot of reasons why they might have done that. I mean, people threw their babies in the fire because of these... Yeah. Molech is the god that demanded children sacrifice. Um, from our point of view, somebody had to decide what bull Well, and I don't know who was the first to create gods. Uh, I know Adam and Eve wanted to be gods, but they didn't necessarily make something into a god. I, I, even even if it did say in the Bible, which I don't think it does, but even if it did say who the first people were. The, the motivation behind that, I'm sure, is was the same as Adam and Eve's. They just want to be God or gods, and so they make something that they think they can control. Even the children of Israel in the desert, they made a golden calf, mm -hmm. and they knew God. They saw Him all the time. Yep. And but but we know that story. Who did they give all the credit to? The golden calf. Mm -hmm. This is our God. This is the God that led us out of Egypt. But it didn't exist on the man. Yes, you're correct. 
But but the, but but the goal that the, the calf itself, uh, maybe not the one that they made, but I mean the Egyptians did have a god that was a calf, and it was a god of fertility and whatever else, and so they they may have, they didn't create a, a new god when they made the golden calf. They were making one of the Egyptian gods. Did you know that? No, I didn't know. That. Okay, yeah. So it's not like they were making a brand new god up. They were they were copying one of e Egypt's gods. Um, and, and for whatever reason, so gave it the credit. They treated very much like we view statues of Jesus or something. Like that. They're not holy, but we don't think they're holy. We really don't think they have any power. But they well, thought, some, they some Christians worship certain statues and think they have power, but not Lutherans. But the original question is, um, so why did they do that? Uh, well, the answer is I don't know. But I think it has something to do with our sinful nature that just wants to control God. And so we make God out of whatever we think we want to make him out of, and then we thank that God for whatever we think it's done for us. But as Christians, we look at that and go, man, that is so dumb. We know that. But of course, we have the luxury of having a Bible, um, which they did not. Uh, when Moses wrote what he wrote, they were already out of Egypt. So at the time, they didn't have a Bible to look at and go, oh yeah, that's, that's that. Um, they, they relied on the, the, the storytelling ability of their elders. And that may have played a part in it too. So I know we're getting away from the subject, but throughout history, ancient history at least, we see man recognizing that there is a God and seeking him, mm -hmm. seeking God. They want a God. They want somebody mm -hmm. to be in charge of all this. So why in our era are we going the other way? Well, I don't think we are. I think we've always gone away from God. I mean, in the Bible, what does it talk about? Constantly, they were rejecting God and doing their own thing, and we still are. But they still had a God. They rejected Oh, I, I think most people needed a God. Most people still believe in a God. It's not the God of the Bible, but it's a God. Could be uh, uh, Jehovah. I don't know. The Mormons talk about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but that's three separate gods for them. Uh, so they, they they worship a form of a Trinity, but not not our Trinity. Um, other religions around the world have their own gods. I mean, we're still a pretty religious world. It's not a very Christian world. Are, are people at their base always seeking order and uh, this magical God they create supposedly gives them that order and that purpose in their lives? Maybe. Could be. That, that people create gods simply so they have direction, but that still doesn't answer Hazel's because question in, of why. In the book of Samuel, they, they, they didn't have a king, and they prayed for a king so they could have the people of Israel. Well, they did have a king. They just didn't want him. Who was the king of Israel before Saul, who was Israel's first king? Yahweh, God. He was their king. He guided them. He led them. He gave them rules to follow. He was in every way a king. He just wasn't a visible king. <clears throat> he certainly was seen by what he did, but I mean, no one actually saw God. Uh, was it Moses that saw the backside of God? Like God passed by and he said, well, you can see my backside, but I'm not going to show you my face. So there were a couple of people that saw an aspect of God, but, but other than that, I mean, no one ever really saw him. I don't know. I don't know why they, they, they made all these other gods, but, but uh, it's, it's not something that's new. All right, we look at Job. <clears throat> I didn't think we'd start running out of time. We're running out of time. I'm not going to read all of Job because it's a, it's a lengthy, well, it's not a lengthy chapter, but it's long enough. Um, but as you skim it, think about God as creator and tell me 
uh, in, in two minutes, if you have a chance to skim through this, what it says about God. Go ahead, take a couple minutes to, to skim through that. So as you're skimming through that, what are you seeing? It's talking about animals, and what about them? The wild animals, we don't know when they give birth. We have an idea, but we don't actually, we're not there when they do this. Okay. And it's, It's something that happens, we see the, the effects of it, but we don't actually see it happen. Okay, what else? So who's talking in 39? Is that God? God. He's questioning Joel. <clears throat> God made all things possible, and <clears throat> to him should be all glory, not to man. Yeah. Yeah, and if you were to look back at 38, you'd see different things talked about, but it's all the same. God is the creator of, of all that we can see and, and do and, and uh, make use of. So, as Mary said, he's, he's the one who should get glory. Hazel? <coughs> According to this, he not only created it, but he defined how they were going to behave. Right. And that's what we're going to be. We cannot, for example, I think it's verse 9. Is the wild ox willing to serve you? Well, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But is it willing to serve God? Yeah. Um, because God is God and the ox knows that. Now, I don't know if that's true in our day, but it's just a point God was trying to make is the wild ox will willingly serve me. Not, he won't willingly serve you. Um, and, and that goes on in, in other things as well. Verse 19, do you give the horse his might? Well, no, Job, you don't. But I do. I created the horse. I made him powerful. Um, anyway, so God is the one who not only created, but as Hazel said, he gives uh, the, the behaviors, the, um, the, the, uh, the personalities, not, that's not the right word, the attributes of those animals. God is the one who gives them those attributes. So, yeah, you can talk about a horse or an ox being powerful, but where did their power come from? God, who created them to be powerful. Um, I, we're running short on time, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. It says 1 to 13. I'm not going to read 1 to 13. Uh, simply because we're short on time. God bless you. Um, so the first part of that is uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. Bless you again. Is th These are the words of mockers who are asking Christians, you know, where is this, where is the last day? Why is your God not come back yet? Um, verse 4 says, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? Ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Uh, so there is this sense that people are starting to question Christianity. Where is, where is the return of the Lord, uh, as you have promised? Uh, verse 8, do not overlook this one fact, beloved, 
with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. That verse, probably more than other, is used by theistic evolutionists to defend their belief that evolution is true and God's the one who guides it and makes it happen. The problem with that is this has nothing to do with creation. It has everything to do with God's patience. That's what the whole chapter is about, uh, at least up to verse 14. Uh, prior to that, it's all about answering the question, why hasn't the Lord God returned? And the answer is because he's patient. Yes, it may seem like a long time to you, but for God, a thousand years is like a day. It's nothing to him. And it's his timetable that we have to worry about, not our own. Anyone ever wondered about, well, why hasn't God come back yet? I mean, I have. Why hasn't he? Well, as it says here, um, verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So he's waiting. He's waiting for more people to come to repentance. When will the, the requisite number of people come to repentance? I don't know. Does anybody on earth know? No. Who knows? God. And only God. And it, it talks about that in other places. So uh, the reason why this, these verses were cited was specifically to, to point out that one phrase, a day is uh, to the Lord, a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. Time means nothing to God. It means everything to us. We're, we're bound by time, but God is not. Uh, he holds time in his hand. So um, when we're asking him, come on, God, what's, what's the hold up? Let's, let's get this done here. It's not going to work because God's not bound by time the, the way that we are. And then finally, Psalm 100. Which is short, short, sorry. It is short, so if somebody would be willing to read that, it's only five verses long. Make a joyful noise to the earth, to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness, come into his presence and with singing. Know that the Lord, he is, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give him Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, <clears throat> and his faithfulness is to all generations. All right, thank you. All of that's good stuff, but as it pertains to creationism, verse 3, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, we are his. We belong to him. He made us to be his own possession. And, and we don't like to think of ourselves as possessions, so I'm guessing we really don't like to think of ourselves as slaves. But that's what we are. That's how the scriptures describe us as Christians. Slaves to Christ. Now, we, we think of that in terms of, well, it doesn't really mean slaves. Well, it kind of does. But slave is the problem. We, we think of that in, in really negative terms because our country has a terrible history with that. Um, but uh, a slave willingly does the work of its master. <clears throat> uh, uh, a good slave. A faithful slave. Uh, now we know, again, colored by our experiences in America, many slaves did not have a choice. That's not what we're talking about here. Uh, we have a choice, but we choose to serve our God. Uh, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We love this God who made us. What's that? Our master gave us freedom. Yeah. All right. Um, we're running out of time, and, and I. Anyway, let's just finish. Man is a unique creature created in the image of God. We have eternal souls, limited free will, a moral reason or conscience, and dominion over all creation. We are not mere animals. Such an assertion only degrades us, it also insults God who made us holy and unique. All right, so which blanks do you fill in there? Or I can just read it again. Man is a unique creature created in the image of God. We have eternal souls, limited free will, a moral reason or conscience, and dominion over all creation. We are not 
mere animals. Such an assertion not only degrades us, it also insults God who made us holy or unique. I'm going to let you read Psalm 8 on your own because we're running out of time. Christianity, like evolution, is a statement about the history and purpose of the universe. Both offer explanations as to how the universe, including humanity, came to be, based on interpretations of scientific evidence. For Christians, we have two sources of information on which to base our understanding of the universe, science and God's revealed word. So let me read that again. Christianity, like evolution, is a statement about the history and purpose of the universe. Both offer explanations as to how the universe, including humanity, came to be, based on interpretations of scientific evidence. For Christians, we have two sources of information on which to base our understanding of the universe, science and God's revealed word. Finally, evolution can't stand up to the scrutiny of honest science, and that's what Jeff was pointing out earlier, that even, Christ, even people who are not Christian still find issues with evolution. And it certainly doesn't find any basis in Scripture. It is the product of a society that seeks to deny God and his love for humanity. It must be embraced, this is evolution, for the only other choice is to accept the existence of God. Like a lie that grows in order to cover up previous lies, evolution continues to be clung to by those desperate to reject their creator. Let me read that one more time. Evolution can't stand up to the scrutiny of honest science, and it certainly doesn't find any basis in Scripture. It is the product of a society that seeks to deny God and his love for humanity. It must be embraced, for the only other choice is to accept the existence of God. Like a lie that grows in order to cover up previous lies, evolution continues to be clung to by those desperate to reject their creator. All right. George, Joshua 24, Joshua. Uh, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. This is Joshua talking now. But as for me and for my house, we will serve the Lord. So ultimately it comes down to each person has to decide for themselves who is the God of their life. Is it the God who made the universe or some other God? Okay, I'm sorry we're so short of time. God's blessings to all of you. If you want, we can start talking here next time and then continue on with uh, Reverend Neuer's Bible study on the Palestinian and Israeli conflict. God bless all of you.